All right. Thanks for your patience. Sorry for running late. Um, let's get started. So, all right. The plan for today, and I still haven't fixed my weird transparency thing. How huh, interesting. The plan for today is to um, finish off one leftover from last time, uh, but I want to focus the rest of today's lecture on linear regression modeling. Uh, so this is one of those things that, um, so the, the insights, the things you're learning here uh, carry over to all kinds of other statistical analyses uh, and sort of invaluable. It's one of these things that is invaluable to empirical research. Like if you sort of get this one right, you can get virtually all of them right because uh, you sort of understand more of the fundamentals. Now, I, um, so this is going to be a series of probably a few lectures uh, diving deeper and deeper into sort of subtleties of, of doing this. Uh, today's mostly to catch people up. I don't want to make any strong assumptions about the kind of statistical backgrounds you have or the kinds of courses you took before taking this one. Um, if you find some of this boring, then, you know, I'm sorry. Um, it will get more interesting uh, later, I, I'm, I promise, I'm sure. Um, one thing I want to follow up on, so some of you have mentioned that um, it's sort of unclear where stuff is happening. So I guess the, the go-to place for everything, uh, and this is entirely my fault, I should have sort of reinforced and, and reminded you of all of this uh, throughout our lecture so far. The go-to place for everything is our website. That's where I post all of the slide decks from lecture. Um, that's where I also post, uh, well, all the videos are on YouTube, but I post links to the videos on YouTube on the class webpage. Uh, and essentially, so that's your, uh, should be your go-to place for um, readings. And there's, you know, the an annotated bibliography for uh, stuff to, to read and what to read from the different references and so on. So all of that is on the class website. Uh, I'm a few lectures behind on posting slides. I've been posting all the videos. So like those of you that, uh, have been following this remotely, have uh, I'm sure you've seen the videos, but um, I'm a few lectures behind on posting slides. So I, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll do that as soon as I can. Um, so this was in response to a question from, from somebody about, you know, where do we find stuff and where do we look for things? The class website is the, the first point of entry and you should find links to stuff there. Uh, so that's sort of, that's where everything happens. Uh, and, you know, I, I didn't always mention it explicitly. In fact, I hardly ever mentioned it explicitly, except for maybe the first lecture uh, and today. Uh, but I kind of, you know, assumed that you remembered that that's where everything is, is being posted. So, you know, hopefully you, you know now and I'll remind you more if, if needed. Um, okay, a couple of other things. Uh, I really hope you're spending all this time uh, either reading stuff to uh, get more depth than we are able to cover in class, or actually, ideally, uh, in addition to that, working on your research projects. Uh, it just dawned on me the other day that we are uh, halfway through the semester already. It's like it's, I guess, from from now onward, there's less remaining than than we've done. Uh, so it's sort of, I don't know, I don't know when time passed. Uh, it sort of happened very quickly, but um, the main deliverable for class, as I'm sure you know, is uh, so some research output from, from your side, some um, write-up and a presentation at the end. We are uh, saving the last two lectures to so go and, and hopefully enough depth into your research projects uh, for final presentation. So you know, hopefully you're spending this time between now and early May kind of really working on your research projects. Uh, so that's what I, uh, I recommend that you're, you're doing. Um, something else still, um, there's uh, two, two additional things I want to ask you kind of un until the end of the semester. One is I'll send this out uh, as a Google Doc and feel free to sign up. Um, I would like you, so just like we had Kyle and Hannah present a couple of papers last time or whenever that was, uh, I'd like to ask the rest of you to present something at least once. So I'll send out, uh, I don't know, hopefully later today, I'll send out a uh, doc with some suggested readings, papers to uh, discuss in class. 
and I'd like you to sign up to be the lead presenter for, for those. Um, the idea is to, so I guess you, you've seen the example of uh, Kyle and Hannah's presentation from before. I think ideally we could try to be a little bit more brief uh, on, the, on summarizing the paper uh, so that we have more time to actually critique the design of the study. Uh, and so, you know, feel free to skip over uh, parts of the paper. So to try to extract the essence of the design of that study. And so the essence of the um, findings and the research questions and so on, the methods being used. And it's okay if you don't cover all, all the things that the authors report in the paper. And so just to try to focus on really the essentials. Um, and so these are all uh, hopefully exemplars. They're all hopefully good examples of, sort of applications of these different methods that we will be discussing between now and the end of the semester. Um, and um, I, I'd like us all to read those before uh, class when that happens. So I'll, I'll be more clear about what to read by when. Uh, I, that was another piece of feedback that uh, I got from you already um, after last time. And so not the reading assignments weren't clear enough. So I'll, I'll do better to make those clearer for the second half of the semester. But so hopefully everybody reads the uh, papers before a class when they're scheduled to be presented. And the presentation leads actually do what Kyle and Hannah did last time and sort of walk us through the paper uh, and so sort of summarize the research questions, the methods and the results. And then we sort of have a discussion uh, critiquing the design. Uh, so that, that's one thing. Uh, so again, to summarize this, hopefully uh, everybody presents at least once. So there will be so sufficient papers between now and May that uh, everybody gets to present once. I guess we could give Kyle and Hannah a break. Um, so, you know, they, they can uh, present with lower priority since they've already presented. So you know, hopefully other folks can present before Kyle and Hannah get to present again. Uh, but that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, there's going to be a uh, so quantitative data analysis assignment um, that I will be posting shortly. Uh, so this is uh, in response to Hannah's request for more homework. No, I, I'm, it's an easy target. I'm sorry for I keep picking on you, but no, of, co of course not. Uh, uh, you know, don't um, don't be upset with Hannah. This is not her fault. Um, no, but uh, I, I want to give you a chance to um, practice some of these uh, statistical analysis techniques that we discuss in class by yourselves, hands on. Feel free to do this, do this in pairs if you want, uh, but it's, it's going to involve analyzing some data uh, and applying some of these statistics. So that's sort of the other thing between now and the end of the semester. Okay, so, so two things left to do in addition to your research projects, which is the main thing, hopefully the thing you're spending most of your time on, and readings. Okay, so one, leading one presentation, sometime between now and the end, or there'll be a schedule, uh, and this data analysis homework. Okay, so that's the plan. Any, any questions on any of these before I continue? Okay. Um, so today's lecture, uh, this so something I wanted to rehash from uh, that I didn't get to cover last time, but uh, today's lecture is mostly focused on an introduction to linear regression. And I have taken the material from these two books that you see here, which will be posted to uh, our usual Google Drive folder that uh, hopefully you have access to already. Um, so you can find you can find the actual chapters from the books in the in the drive folder there. All right, so let's get started. So a couple of things from, from last time uh, left over. So this idea of type one and type two errors, this, this is something that's important to know as we're going into all kinds of statistics because they creep up everywhere. So it's sort of important to know what they are uh, so that you keep them at the back of your minds as you're doing all kinds of statistics, including in your homework. So um, typically, Right, we're going to be talking about so hypothesis testing a lot. Uh, that comes up in all kinds of scenarios, including in this regression uh, discussion for today. So the idea is with all of these hypothesis tests, of which there are many, uh, you may or may not have taken uh, entire courses on statistics. So I, I, I don't want to make any assumptions about your particular backgrounds. 
but um, so th there's a ton of these and you know, we're not gonna cover all of them uh, in, uh, in, in any depth really. Uh, there's entire books written about these, uh, sometimes books written about uh, every one of them. So th this is a lot to cover, we won't be able to do that. But typically the point of all of these is to answer this question, like whether um, random chance could be responsible for some observed effect that you've, you've measured. Maybe you've run an experiment, maybe you're doing a, an observational study, you know, maybe you've collected data somehow, and you want to uh, be able to claim that whatever differences, if any, you're observing are not due to random chance, they're due to the, the thing you actually care about in your study. Okay, so typically this means that you have some null hypothesis that you're uh, trying to disprove, if you will, uh, and an alternative hypothesis that you uh, accept instead, if, if that's the case. So the null hypothesis is typically that um, chance is to blame for whatever difference, say, between two groups of participants in your experiment uh, that you've observed. Uh, for example, it could be uh, referring to this NL2 code tool that we kept talking about. It could be that there's no difference in the mean time to completion of tasks when people are using this uh, tool versus when they're writing code from scratch. And I think this is sort of where we left off last time. Um, and the, um, so that's the null. The alternative is the counterpoint to that. It's whatever you're trying to prove with your study. Um, for example, with this NL2 code uh, scenario, it could be that it takes less time on average to complete tasks when using this uh, intelligent coding assistant uh, as compared to writing code from scratch. Okay, that would be the alternative hypothesis. So you, you know, you're faced with uh, doing some kind of statistical analysis and some kind of hypothesis test to um, see if you have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis instead, which is what you're hoping to achieve, I assume, with your study, right? Um, so this is where these uh, types of errors creep in. Uh, and if you're uh, familiar with machine learning of any kind, you've probably heard about these by, by different names uh, in the context of so classification and machine learning. So um, let's say that, um, right, so like the, the normal scenarios are when uh, there's say, no difference in reality between participants using the tool and, and not using the tool. And your experiment also does not find any difference, right? So there's no difference in reality and you don't find any difference. That's the top left check mark there. So that's fine. Um, or um, there is really, you know, really in reality, there should be a difference, right? If people using the tool maybe complete tasks faster, write code faster. Um, and you're, you're able to detect that difference with your experiment. You've so set it up in such a way that you're able to identify that, to detect that difference, right? That's the bottom right uh, cell there. So all of these are sort of the, the normal behavior, right? Like if there's something there in reality and you've so set up uh, your study correctly uh, and you find it, that's all fine. And you know, if, if there's no, nothing there in reality and you've set up your study correctly uh, and you don't find anything there, that's also fine, right? That's the expected behavior. So the errors are, um, the other two cells remaining there. Um, so if there's no difference in reality, but you somehow detect one using your uh, study through your experiment, for example, that's called a type one error, a false positive. Okay, so there, it's, it's not meant to be a positive there. It's not meant to be, a, there's not meant to be any difference there in reality, right? But we can't really measure uh, reality precisely, so we approximate it, okay? Um, and because you've, I don't know, you've uh, misconfigured your study or what have you, you're detecting some, some difference there between the two groups of participants when there shouldn't have been one. This is called a type one error, a okay? false positive in, in classification terms. And the opposite, so that's the top right one. The bottom left one is uh, when there, um, should have been a difference, okay? We, we know for you know, whatever reason that uh, people should be faster when writing code using the tool than, than when writing it by scratch, by hand. Uh, 
uh, from scratch, but your experiment is not able to detect that. Okay, so that's called a false negative. It's falsely negative. The, res the result of your experiment, your conclusion is falsely negative. You would conclude based on your experiment that there's no difference uh, between these groups and that the tool is ineffective perhaps, when that's not the case, right? It's, it would be a false conclusion, falsely negative conclusion, because in reality, there should have been a difference there. Okay, so these are the two types of errors. So you know, remember them by these names. These are the technical terms that uh, are being used in the literature when referring to all of these type one and type two errors. So that where, where does this come up in, by, by the way, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I, I can only see a subset of you on my screen. So I, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if you're confused or, or anything like that. I can't, I can't see everybody. So just feel free to interrupt me. Um, all right, so we, we talked about this. Um, so, right, so hypothesis testing is so typically designed um, so that it protects you against being fooled by random chance. Uh, and typically they're designed to minimize type one errors, minimize false positives. Why? That's where these p-values come in, right? We've, we've talked a lot about p-values and you, you're maybe familiar with this already. Um, so the, actually the probability, well, we talked about p-values last time too, but um, the probability of making a type one error um, is called um, uh, alpha. And that's also denoted by this, this p-value. Um, and um, typically that's something you set uh, ahead of your study. So, you, so it's something you decide on before you even collect any data, before you look at any data. Uh, and the typical magic threshold for um, type one errors is this 5% threshold that you've maybe seen in, in research studies. Uh, it's most commonly used, right? So people consider if, uh, you obtain after some hypothesis test a p-value that is lower than 5%, you conclude that there's sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. Right? So that's still typically how this works. And this 5% is this magic, uh, arbitrary really threshold that is just being used commonly in practice. Um, okay, so that's sort of how you, um, I guess to protect yourself against these type one errors to reduce the likelihood that um, the data you have could have been um, uh, observed while the null hypothesis is, is true, uh, data as extreme or more than the one you have could have been observed given that the null hypothesis is true. Uh, you want to protect against that by setting this threshold to be very, very low, right? You want to say that there's very little chance for that to have happened, right? So if that's the case, then you sort of conclude the opposite. You, you accept the alternative hypothesis. Okay, so that's where this comes in. So now here's a, here's a cool exercise. So let's, um, let's play with this for a minute. So imagine now you have 20 variables, okay? Um, that you have measured um, and you want to study their uh, correlation, their effect on some outcome variable that you care about. Say, I don't know, um, uh, productivity of, of typing code or efficiency of, of writing code or something or task completion time, whatever it might be. Uh, so now here's the catch. Imagine that all of these 20 variables, you haven't actually measured from, I don't know, real data, but you've actually made up uh, and they're randomly generated and they're like truly randomly generated, not the sort of pseudo fake random, uh, the human bias random generated that we, we played with last time. Okay, so you use whatever random number generator you want to actually generate these 20 variables. Okay, so now you do some statistical tests for each of these to see if they are correlated with the outcome. Okay, uh, the outcome is also randomly generated. Everything here is randomly generated, okay? Uh, and you set this magic threshold of alpha 5%, 5% level, uh, and you do one test for every pair of predictor variable and outcome. Okay, so 20 tests in total, like one for every predictor, uh, each predictor with the outcome, okay? So now, what is the probability of 
um, obtaining false positives, meaning um, discovering a uh, statistically significant effect um, at this 5% level uh, falsely, right? Because everything has been randomly generated, right? So if you detect a statistically significant effect there, it shouldn't have been there by construction. We know that it shouldn't have been there because all of these things have been randomly generated, right? They can by construction not be uh, correlated in any way, okay? Right, so we know that uh, these are false positives. So now what is the probability that that would happen. And by the way, 20, uh, you know, having 20 variables in a study is not, is not unheard of. Like we, so it's, uh, this is not an unrealistic scenario. I guess it's one minus 95% to the 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's, um, I think that's correct. So let's walk through this the probability that one of these tests will um, correctly uh, test non-significant, right? Because there shouldn't be any effect there. The probability of that is 95%, right? So the, you've set the um, false positive rate to be 5% ahead of time, right? So what's remaining is that this is a true negative, rather, right? So it's the expected behavior. Um, and so that's 95%, it's the difference, okay? So that's for, for one, each one of these. So now for all 20, the probability that they will uh, all correctly test non-significant, which should be the case, is uh, like Bobo said, this to the power 20, right? It's just you're multiplying all of these probabilities. Okay, so probability that all 20 of these will correctly test non-significant should be um, 36% as per this uh, calculation here. So what this leaves you with is the probability that at least one of them will falsely test significant, which is the complement. Okay? So that's a one minus this thing that we just computed. Okay, 64%. So think about that for a minute. You have 20 variables in your model, in your study, and you're doing some kind of hypothesis test for each of them. Okay, the probability that at least um, one of these tests will result in a false positive is 64%. That is huge. That is much greater than the probability of getting your paper accepted at, I don't know, um, ICSI or CHI or wherever you submit papers to. Okay, so think about that. Huge. Okay, so um, I, this is why the headline here is, you know, if you torture the data long enough, you will confess to something. That's sort of the idea that basically you can sort of you know, if you interrogate the, the data long enough, like, you know, if you interrogate it 20 times, it will, um, it's more likely than, than not that it will, you know, turn up something significant that you can report on in a paper. Okay, Does that makes sense? So how do we, how do we protect ourselves from this? Just the report results on a higher or uh, smaller alpha level. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's, you know, that's one way you can, um, you can be more exclusive here. You can say, you know, 5% turns out when you're doing 20 comparisons is actually way too permissive as per this calculation. Okay, so, you know, maybe you wanna be much stricter than that, but really, um, um, you shouldn't be doing this in the first place. You shouldn't be uh, drawing conclusions from solely these uh, significant or not p-values of whatever test you're running, okay? So that's just bad practice. What you should be doing instead is to always compute 
In addition to the statistical significance, which obviously you want to include as well, but in addition to this, you want to compute some measure of effect size, so some, some practical relevance, some practical significance. Okay, in addition to um, you know, taking all of these precautions for um, statistical significance and being more exclusive and so on, you want to accompany these um, conclusions, these claims that you'll be making by evidence of some non-negligible effect size as well. So the idea is that you know, when you have lots of data and we're doing lots of comparisons and whatnot, lots of tests, chances are you'll just stumble across something, okay? Um, you also want to estimate that whatever effect or difference you've detected is actually meaningful, is meaningful in, in practice. So for example, um, I, I believe we talked about this uh, paper a study of the impact of tweets on academic citations. It was a cool study, it was a randomized experiment um, that had concluded that it's really useful. You get four times as many, two times as many citations for your papers on average when you tweet about them. You remember that one? We talked about it a few weeks ago. Um, and my complaint at the time was that you know, if you actually also, in addition to this statistically significant effect and difference, you also estimate the, the size of that effect, but you would notice that maybe the results are less optimistic than you had thought originally, because the absolute number of citations you can expect to gain on average is still rather small, right? because most things just do not get cited, period. So it takes you from zero to close to zero, but you haven't really you know, gone viral. Right? So that was an example of also thinking about the size of these effects, right? not just that they're statistically significant, which is very easy to obtain, especially with lots of data, but also sort of how practically meaningful are they? Okay? So that's, that's something to, to leave you with uh, at the back of your minds. Okay, any thoughts on, on this? Okay, so um, let's look at, let's move on to sort of our main topic for today. And let's look at an example. Um, we're gonna be using this as a running example throughout. So uh, this is to remind you kind of an introduction to linear regression to remind you sort of how this works. If you haven't seen this in a while or haven't seen this at all, uh, and feel free to read more about this in the, in the references I provide or, or ask me afterwards. Um, okay, so here we have um, a data set of um, uh, sales, so, you know, sales in thousands of dollars of some product uh, as a function of the amount of advertising that was done on TV, radio, and through newspapers. Uh, in the same unit, uh, thousands of dollars, uh, for some 200 cities. Okay, so every little point there uh, is one of these cities in which the data was collected. Okay, so running example. So this is actually not unlike a lot of the data that you will be looking at in your empirical computer science research. Um, because, because the kinds of questions that people care about addressing with this data set are very similar to the kinds of questions that you might care uh, to address with your data sets. So for example, um, first kind of question you might wanna address is, is there a relationship between the advertising budget and sales? There, does it matter how much you spend on advertising? Um, it could be something else. You know, does it matter how much you test your code? Do you get fewer defects the more you test, right? So you could think of the you know, analogs for all of these questions that apply in your particular research or in our domain. Another one, um, how strong is the relationship? So not just that there is one, but so how strong is it? How strong is the relationship between, in this case, advertising budget and sales? 
Another one, which type of media contributes to sales? We uh, had three examples, radio, newspapers, and TV. Like which of these contributes to sales the most? Okay, so in your case, maybe you have three interventions or something that you're trying, you're looking to compare. Like which of those or three factors you're studying, which of those contributes to the outcome? Um, how accurately can we estimate this effect? Like is this, you know, how, how much can we trust this? How accurate is it? How accurately can we predict future sales? Perhaps you care about that as well. Perhaps you care to predict sort of what's gonna happen uh, in the future. For example, uh, in, uh, in our group, we study, um, one of the things we study is the risk of open source projects becoming abandoned or, or unmaintained. Um, right, so how well could we predict that future level of activity in some open source project? What would be the uh, analogous question there? Um, what's the nature of this relationship? Is it linear, for example? Okay. Um, is there some synergy or some interaction between uh, advertising media in this case, or between different interventions or practices or what have you in, in our case? Okay. So lots of questions that we can um, relate to from our own domain and our own research that apply to this particular data set. So just to remind you here, the intuition, intuition. You have, let's say, we're talking about a simple case where you have two variables, an X and a Y, uh, and that's the scatter plot you see there behind me um, of the different data that was collected or observed uh, for these, these variables. So for, you know, for every value of X, you've measured some value of Y, and this is sort of what the relationship looks like. Um, you can think about estimating a linear model. Uh, that means a line that the so best approximates or represents this cloud of points. Okay? Uh, and there's actually tons. There's tons of these possible linear models that you could think of. Okay, So yeah, literally every line you can imagine is a linear model of this particular data set. Um, some of them aren't very good, but they're all models of this data set. Okay? Uh, some of them are very poor approximations of this set of points, but they're all approximations of this set of points. So like, how do you find a good one? Uh, so typically what you try to do is you try to minimize this, this error between the um, observed value of Y for every value of X and the predicted value of Y. So that's the value of the, of the line there. Uh, and that's the that's, that's main idea behind these linear regression models is to, to find these lines that best approximate um, a set of points such that this uh, error is, is minimized. Okay. Um, and whatever you're left with is called residuals. So that's like all the stuff that, um, you know, because obviously you won't be able to draw a straight line, one straight line through all of these points, right? So like there's all, always going to be some um, error there in, in your uh, in your model. Your model is by definition a model and approximation. So it's not going to be able to uh, represent uh, more than two points uh, accurately, right? Unless you sort of somehow get lucky and have more be uh, on the same line, but it's, um, that's not to be expected. So whatever you're left with is called the residuals. That's the stuff that um, um, the, the, the predictive error, if you will, or the um, whatever's between the your predicted value and the actual observed value. Um, okay, so the um, so with linear regression, the so stereotypical kind of regression that people do is this least squares uh, regression, uh, and that uh, tries to do exactly this thing. It tries to so sort of find this line between uh, all of these points such that this um, uh, mean squared error is, is, is minimized um, from, from all the different points to your line. Um, so the sum of squared errors is, is minimized. Um, and you can see how you need, so every line can be represented through um, so an equation like the one I have there with two coefficients, right? So you have some, um, slope coefficient, that's the beta one you see there, multiplied by X. And then you have some um, 
whatever's left over. The leftover term is called the intercept in, in linear regression. Um, but that's just the, the, whatever is left over, right? So this is the uh, standard way of, of um, describing any, any line. So the idea is that you have these observed values of X and Y, uh, but you don't know what these parameters beta are. Um, so you're learning them, you're learning them from the data, okay? So, um, so how do you uh, measure or assess the accuracy of these estimates of your coefficients, the betas? How do you know that? Um, well, so let's say there's some true relationship. Let's say that the real, uh, you know, let's say you could, you could know that the true relationship here um, is of this form, um, y equals 3x plus 2, okay? Um, so, so that's your, your gold standard, the thing you're, you're hoping to approximate. Um, and the, um, so that's the red line you see in the plot there. Uh, and obviously you can't get that because you know, that would uh, involve no measurement error and, and you know, perfectly set up uh, everything, experiment and so on, uh, access to all individuals and in the population, right? Which is never possible. We always look at a sample of the population, not the entire population and so on and so forth. So like lots of reasons why you can't actually get that. But what you're hoping to do is get as close to that as you can. So you have some uh, least squares estimate for that true relationship, right? That you're uh, estimating based on the observed data. So that's the blue line you see, you see there in the plot. Okay, so the name of the game is so getting uh, as close as possible to this true relationship, which you cannot actually measure, um, right? It's unobserved. So, uh, right, so there's lots of these, lots of these uh, possible least squares, least squares lines that you can compute given different uh, random sets of observations. Um, and the idea is that, you know, if you have enough of these random sets of observations, that you can compute so we can estimate these least squares regression lines from. Uh, the idea is that the average of many of these lines, of, of these lines, is going to be really close to the true uh, population regression line. Okay, so that's sort of the, the key idea here. You can't actually observe the true regression line, but you can um, try to approximate it through these. Um, inferred estimated lines on samples. Okay, so this is analogous to how you're estimating, so you might remember this from uh, some stats class that you took uh, probably at some point in your undergrad. Um, this is analogous to estimating the population mean of some random variable. Um, and this is where this notion of standard errors comes in. Okay, so you actually, you don't, you don't, you can't measure the actual population mean, right? But you can measure this uh, mean of some sample that you've drawn from the population, okay? Uh, and then you reason about these standard errors of your uh, sample mean estimate, okay? And those tell you uh, ab about how far off you are from the true mean, okay? So this is where also this idea of confidence intervals comes in. If you remember this from, from stats. So for, um, for example, 95% confidence interval is defined as a range of values um, such that with 95% probability, the range will contain the true unknown value of this parameter you're trying to estimate. So the, the key terms here are standard errors and confidence intervals, which you maybe remember from, uh, from statistics. So this entire idea of um, so computing these and estimating these confidence intervals pours over to estimating these regression coefficients, turns out. Uh, and you can read uh, all of these details in, uh, you know, in any stats book, um, including the ones I recommended. So, um, 
you know, for example, so, you know, by the way, any statistical uh, analysis software that you will be using, I use R myself, but there's lots of other ones that you could be using. Some people use Stata or something. Lots of people use Python. Um, all of these would you know, compute all of these things for you. So um, you never have to do these by hand. Uh, but okay, so the, um, for, for something like linear regression, the 95% confidence interval for these coefficients uh, looks like this. So you have um, some estimate uh, of the coefficient that you get out of these statistical packages uh, and some standard error for that coefficient that you get for free out of these statistical packages, or you can compute them by hand if you want. I, I leave that as homework exercise for, uh, for people that need to brush up on, on stats. Um, and so, but these are the kinds of things that you get out of uh, a model estimated on some particular data using any statistical package of your, of your choosing. Okay. So um, for example, right, so but, um, for this um, sales example, let's say we're looking at the TV advertising, uh, one of the three um, data sets we have there. Um, and we've estimated the 95% confidence interval for these two coefficients, uh, the two betas there, as being those things you see there on the screen behind me. Um, so how do you interpret these? You interpret these in the same way that um, we uh, talked about interpreting, um, when we talked about sort of random sampling and things like that, and a margin of error and confidence level and those things a few, a few weeks ago, if you remember that. So here, um, the way you read these is that, um, for example, in the absence of any advertising, okay, so that's the, the beta zero coefficient, okay? You're assuming the TV advertising budget is zero. Okay, so in the absence of any advertising, sales will on average fall somewhere between um, 6,000 something and 7,900 something units. Okay, so that's the confidence interval, 95% confidence interval for this uh, intercept coefficient, the beta zero. And similarly, um, for every $1,000 increase in TV advertising, there will be an average increase in sales between 42 and 53 units. Um, note that the, why the thousands here, because all of those units that we had measured and we had uh, regressed over were in thousands. I, I mentioned that in the beginning, okay? So typically the way you interpret these, by the way, so I should have started with that. Um, the way you interpret these coefficients, the, the one for um, the slope, the beta one coefficient, the slope of this line, um, the way you interpret that is the following. You're saying, how, what happens to the value of y the outcome for every one unit increase in this value of in, in, in x. So this estimated coefficient, the, the slope of this line tells you exactly that. Tells you what, how much does y change if x changes by one? Okay, so this is why this interpretation that you see here. For every unit increase in TV advertising, but the unit here is thousands. So that's why I'm calling this for every thousand dollar increase in TV advertising. That means for every unit increase in TV advertising, there'll be an average increase in sales of that uh, beta one value, which I'm also transforming into thousands uh, because of how the data was, was coded. So the 42 and 53 units you see there uh, on the bottom corresponds to that confidence interval you see there on, on the top. Okay, so that's how you read these. Um, all right, so now here's the catch. Okay, this is the million dollar idea, okay, you ready? This is what makes all of this uh, empirical research possible. This is, this is why this kind of, or any kind of regression modeling is so useful for data analysis and uh, empirical research. Here's the million dollar idea. The million dollar idea is the following that it is that it turns out these standard errors can also be used to perform hypothesis tests on the coefficients. 
So you can um, interpret these, um, you, you can use them to test hypotheses. So here, the null hypothesis is that there's no relationship between an X and a Y. The alternative hypothesis is that there's some relationship between X and a Y. Okay. So this turns out is equivalent, this corresponds to testing that the beta coefficient you've estimated from your data, you've learned from the data, testing whether that is statistically significantly different from zero or not. This is the million dollar idea or billion dollar idea or what have you, okay? So if it's not statistically significantly different from zero, okay? If it's basically zero, then you can conclude that there is no relationship between X and Y. Okay, because if, if the coefficient is zero, it doesn't matter what you multiply it by. It will have no impact on the value of Y. Yeah, okay? you can plug anything you want into X. It won't matter at all if you multiply it by zero, right? The value of Y will only depend on the beta zero coefficient. Okay, so this is the idea. And um, so basically all of these packages that you will be using or, or software that you'll be using, uh, in my case R, will give you these, um, all of these uh, T statistics that have computed from this and the associated P values and whatnot that allow you to make these conclusions to uh, decide if you have reason enough to reject the null hypothesis. So basically what you're seeing, so let me show you an example. I think I have one. No, here's one example, maybe not the best, but here's one example. This is the kind of information you would be getting from, uh, I don't know, R or what have you, All right? So we've estimated this simple linear regression model, which means we've estimated the values of those two coefficients for um, slope and for intercept, okay? Uh, and you get their standard errors for free from the uh, software you're using. And these values of the T statistic, you can read more about this. And the P values that you can directly interpret using this magical 5% threshold. Okay. Uh, you can directly interpret as um, evidence in uh, favor of uh, rejecting the null hypothesis or not. Okay. So, Again, let me, let me say this again. The million dollar idea here is that you can conclude, right? Statistically, quantitatively, that two variables are related if the value of this uh, coefficient estimate is statistically different from zero, right? With high probability. This is, this is most precisely testing that they have a linear relationship, right? Correct. Okay. Cor correct. Yes. But um, the reason why I, I'm calling this the million dollar idea is because there are a gazillion flavors of regression. Um, we're talking about linear, the simplest kind, right? The, the one that's easiest to understand and learn. We're talking about that one today. But this, this key idea that you can... Um, do hypothesis testing to uh, see if these coefficients are different from zero or not. This carries over to all kinds of regression, right? And all kinds of relationships you might want to model and so on. Right, so that, that key idea stays. It's just the, the flavor of the model that changes. So here's what this looks like in, um, in R, so that um, hopefully you're convinced, look how pretty it is. You're convinced to adopt R if you haven't already. So on the top there, you see an example, very simple uh, data set of, I don't know, a few points, a dozen points, maybe fewer. Um, and um, you see sort of the R output for this simple linear regression model uh, that I estimated 
on this data set. So there's two variables there, right? An X and a Y, or X, X1 and Y1 in, on the screen. Um, and so that's a very, very simple model. And you get two, uh, so you see the coefficients about how, I, there's no way for me to point at the screen, I don't think. Yeah, you don't see my cursor, do you? No. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, is there any way? Can I annotate? I don't know how to do this. Anyway, so um, I'll just describe this. So somewhere there in the middle of the screen, you see a line that says coefficients and, and then estimate under that. That's the, the, the two values of the betas that have been estimated, right? So remember the shape of this line is something of the form y equals beta zero plus beta one times x, okay? So the two unknowns, the things you're learning, you're estimating are the beta one and the beta zero coefficients. And the values that have been estimated for those coefficients you see there under the estimate column in the middle of the screen. Okay, so the estimate, the beta one estimate uh, for the, thing, the slope, I think you're multiplying by x1 is 0.5. And the intercept is three in this example, right? This is an artificial data set, but that's how you read those. Yeah, those are the, the values that have been estimated from this data that you've observed. Okay, did you find those on the screen? Okay, so now on the same lines where you have X1 and intercept, intercept is the, the free term. Um, on the same line at the end, you see, so you see these other things that, um, I mentioned that you get for free earlier, the standard errors and this, the value of this T statistic, which you can read about, uh, and this P value, that's the thing at the right-hand side there, the probability that uh, um, you, uh, this value of T that you've uh, observed is, is unlikely. Um, th that's your P value, the thing you care about in order to conclude that you can reject or not the null hypothesis. That's the thing you see there on the last column, okay? Um, and the way you interpret this is uh, relative to this magical 5% uh, threshold typically. So in this case, uh, you see that both of those p-values are less than 5%. Therefore, you can conclude individually for each of those two coefficients you can conclude that each of those two coefficients is statistically significantly different from zero. And therefore you can conclude that um, that's especially relevant for the X1 coefficient. That's the one you care about. The, the intercept is not very interesting, uh, but you can conclude because of the X1 coefficient estimate, the p-value for that is less than 5%. You can conclude that there's a relationship linear in this case between x1 and, and y or x and y okay so the million dollar question you had going into this is you know are these things related right you is uh amount of testing that i do on my software related to uh, the amount of bugs i observed is the size of the team related to their productivity is the diversity of their team related to their effectiveness, whatever research question you might have, right, can be ported over to so a framework not dissimilar to this one here, where you end up uh, interpreting uh, p values of these coefficient estimates in some regression. Okay, so super useful and valuable piece of machinery, right? Uh, it won't always be this this exact linear model, and it will get more interesting in a minute too. Uh, even this one will get more interesting in a minute, but it will always be this idea, right? So this idea will will stay with you forever whenever you do things like this. Uh, let's see. It's, it's the only other thing that's interesting in that output from R is maybe this um, R squared measure that tells you something about how well the data fits this model that you've estimated. So that's sort of a value between 
zero and one, I think. And uh, you know, the higher, the better. So it tells you a little bit about how, um, how good this model is. Right? The closer to one you are, the, the more, um, the, the better the model is in some sense. Oops. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more realistic. Um, so, I mean, if you're just doing two things, like, you know, an, an A, X, and a Y, like two at a time, is probably not very interesting. Um, so, can you extend this framework, this analysis to accommodate more variables, more predictors? Yes, of course you can. Um, so, you, one way you could do that is maybe to just run three separate regressions. Okay, so you could, you could, the first one we did is the one on top there, the one for TV, uh, and you could repeat this machinery, you could plug in a radio and newspaper and you know, estimate these separate regressions for each of those. Um, I want you to um, note something here, note how in all three of these individual bivariate regressions, the coefficient estimates for the interesting variables there are all statistically significant. Okay, so all of those p-values that we've already seen the one for TV a minute ago, but also the ones for radio and newspaper, they're below this magical threshold of 5%. Okay, so if you were to do this, you would conclude that each of these three variables is associated with the amount of sales. Okay. Okay. So that's one way of doing this. But uh, arguably, it's not the best way of doing this because, um, because you're not taking into consideration uh, any of the other variables at the same time as you're uh, computing this model for any one of them. Um, and like, often these things sort of um, interact and are correlated and so sort of do things uh, to confound each other in, in all kinds of ways. Um, and it's typically always better to um, estimate these models jointly over all of these predictors at the same time as opposed to individually for every one of them separately. So we can extend this model um, to include all of these predictors. They, they just each get a separate slope. Does that make sense? So I've just, um, I've just extended this, I've added more predictors and given each of them their own slope. Uh, and I'm using that epsilon notation for this error term. Like whatever is left over that um, um, whatever is left over from from this sum. So now here's the other million dollar idea. There were two million dollar ideas. This is the second million dollar idea from this. The way you interpret these coefficients, that, that these betas you interpret them as the average effect on the outcome, the Y variable, sales, for example, in this case, for every one unit increase in that particular variable. Okay, so, and, 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 okay, wait for it, while holding all of the other ones fixed. That's the second million dollar idea. Okay. That's, the, that's the interpretation of these, uh, of these coefficients here, okay. is how much does uh, the Y variable, the outcome change when you're changing the, that particular X by one unit while holding everything else fixed. Okay, it's not a, it's not a Hopefully it's clear why that is, what is the case. But why, why is this the million dollar idea, do you ask? Why is this a million dollar idea? Mm. 
mean, my only guess as to why this is better than computing them individually is because you get a better uh, you get a better estimate of what beta zero is because you have more data. No, but so uh, the, the part in yellow, I'm, I'm asking about like, why is so this interpretation that um, you can interpret these coefficients in isolation of all the other things that you have in there, right? You can assume that everything else stays fixed when you're interpreting these individual betas, when you have all of them together in a regression like this. I'm calling that the second million dollar idea from today. Why, why am I doing that? Because you can isolate the effect from the single variable and this can possibly lead to causal pre hmm. prediction or explanation. That's the, that's the idea. Remember this discussion? I asked you, I don't know, a, a week or so ago, I asked you to remember these three things, the three ingredients to establishing a causal relationship. Uh, I believe that it's the only thing I asked you to remember from that particular lecture, okay? So the three were the cause precedes the effect, so some temporal precedence. The cause must be related to the effect, and we should exclude plausible alternative explanations for that effect other than the cause, okay? So this is sort of the holy grail of, uh, of science is establishing causal relationships. And this particular property of these, um, of, of any multiple regression model, be it linear or otherwise, they're all, they, they all have this amazing property is that you can, when you're interpreting any one of these betas, you can assume that all of the other ones are held fixed. Obviously all of the other ones that you've included in your model and that you're able to measure. Okay, so it's not, it's not quite the free lunch that you maybe were expecting, right? Because often, you know, we can't actually measure all of the confounding factors, there's some that we just cannot measure, right? So if we can't measure them, it means we cannot control for them, right? So we can't benefit from this magical property, right? We, we, we could if we were able to measure them, but it's, that's sort of the idea, right? So like the more of these things that, you know, may, may have an impact, on the outcome variable, the more of these you can measure, right? The more effectively you can control for them and you can sort of separate their effects, if any, from the effects of the variable that you care about. So let me give you one, one example. Um, classical software engineering um, problem, uh, a classical software engineering problem is defect prediction, okay? You want to be able to uh, estimate, to predict, to model whether some particular piece of code is likely to be defective or not. You want to be able to do that early, right? As early as you can, so that, for example, you could spend more effort testing it, reviewing it, whatever it might be, before you end up releasing it and so on, and before it ends up causing you know, all kinds of uh, uh, damage and, and loss, right? Um, after you've re released it, right? The, the earlier you fix it, the better. So you'd like to be able to predict which things are likely to be buggy or not. Um, and that's because you typically only have a limited quality assurance budget. You can only afford to, I don't know, test your code so much or have so many people, you know, testing your code or what have you, you can't just like test infinitely because then, you know, all you'll be doing is just testing and, and never building anything new. So, um, you, you know, imagine you could predict which things, which files are likely to be buggy. Okay. So now, um, I could 
build a regression model like this that, for example, takes um, the author of the code as a variable, as input, and predicts whether the code is likely to be buggy or not based on that. Okay. So now let's say that I do that and I estimate this model and the coefficient is very significant. And it turns out that code written by uh, Bobo is much more likely to be buggy than code written by Jeremy uh, as per this model. Okay. Right. So you could conclude that, but what if, you know, what if it actually has nothing to do with the author, but rather with something else that you haven't considered? Okay. What if Bobo just happens to be um, working on more complicated programs? Okay. Than Jeremy. And it's really this inherent complexity of the programs that makes them more likely to be buggy, not the fact that Bobo wrote them, right? So in other words, they would have still been buggy if Jeremy had been working on them, right? They're buggy because they're very complicated. They're not buggy because Bobo wrote them, right? So now let's say if you only do this bivariately, you can never tell that. You can never tell whether, um, or you can never trust that this effect of uh, the author you might be detecting from your model is actually due to the author or not due to something else, some confounding factor that you haven't, you haven't measured, you haven't controlled for. So that's when something like this comes in, right? So let's say you can uh, measure this complexity of those programs or something, right? In addition to the author of the program. So now you could have a multiple regression model with both author and complexity. And when you're interpreting this new model, okay, you can assume that complexity is fixed when you're making claims about author as per this magical property, right? So then the claim is much, much stronger. The claim becomes holding fixed the complexity of these programs, we uh, can conclude that a code written by Bobo is more likely to be buggy. Okay? That's a much stronger claim than the one I made originally when I, I wasn't able to control for this. Does that make sense? So again, the million dollar idea is that, you know, this mechanism, uh, the, the way these things are interpreted gets you closer, it doesn't get you there, but gets you closer, gets you in that direction. That's why it's so powerful, right? It allows you to um, essentially exclude plausible alternative explanations as best you can measure them and model them. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess for this method, does it only work if these causes are like um, independent, I guess, linearly or well, independent from each other in that sense? Because um, I guess this, this is, I guess, very reminiscent of how, uh, well, I guess linear, linear independence in like math in terms of like how you can, how you have these vectors that are all orthogonal to each other. But it seems like if, if they're not in this case, then it seems like this method doesn't work that well. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Uh, I will talk about this, uh, I don't know, at some point in the near future. It's part of my deck here, but I don't know if, uh, given the time if I'll get to it. But you're right, you're right. So um, I guess my earlier point was there's no free lunch. So there, there isn't. There isn't going to be a free lunch with this either. Um, it works sometimes and fails some other times. So we'll see, we'll see more examples of, of failures uh, at some point. But you're right. The short answer is you're right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK, so uh, let me show you one more thing here. Uh, back to our advertising example. So remember, we um, there were two flavors of this. On the left-hand side is the flavor where we estimated these individual bivariate models. Okay, for 
TV, radio, and newspaper separately. And if you remember from, I don't know, a few minutes ago, all of those coefficient estimates were statistically significantly different from zero. Therefore, you would, would have concluded that all three of those variables are related to um, the amount of sales, okay? On the right-hand side at the top, you see this uh, flavor where we modeled all of them jointly. Okay, so note how in this joint model, when you're controlling for um, every two of those things, uh, as you're interpreting the third one, when you're um, holding two fixed as you're interpreting the third one, okay? in this joint model, the newspaper effect goes away. You see that? So different conclusion here. Conclusion would be that only TV and radio are associated with sales, that newspapers are not. The newspaper advertising budget is not at all associated with, um, with sales when you model them jointly. So look how different this can be. Okay. Um, okay, let's do, let's see, do a quick one. So um, another thing that's very useful and, and very commonly encountered in practice is interaction effects. So if you think of the standard model, the one with, with two variables, an X, uh, X1 and X2, that looks like, like something uh, you see there. Um, and the interpretation is, uh, for example, uh, if you're looking at, uh, if you're interested in the X1 variable, if you increase X1 by one unit, then we can expect Y will increase by an average of beta one units. That's what the coefficient tells you how much y will increase for every value, every unit increase in x, excuse me. Okay, so that's the standard. Um, now we can extend this with an interaction term, um, effectively the product of the two variables. So I've just added a, a, a product term in this equation and I'm giving it, uh, I'm giving that its own coefficient, it, um, the, the beta three coefficient there. Um, so effectively, right, if I rewrite this equation, that's the same as saying that um, as I adjust x2, okay, that will change the impact that x1 has on y. So remember this discussion of which one was this? Uh, there were some m words that we floated around, I don't know, a few lectures ago. There were two M words that are very commonly confused. Moderator? Moderator. A moderator, okay. Yeah, mo this, what was the other one? Mediator. Yes, so the, the mediator is a link in the causal chain. The moderator is a thing like this. X2 would be a moderator because it changes the strength of the relationship between X1 and Y, okay? X2 would be a moderator, okay? So uh, I guess we'll see, uh, we're, we're out of time. We'll see some examples. We'll pick this up where we left off um, on, on Thursday. I don't wanna keep you over, uh, but I'll stay for questions if, if people have questions. So $2 million ideas from this lecture are that you can use regression models to uh, do hypothesis testing of associations, correlations between variables. And you could do so while controlling for other things that may co-vary which is very, very, very powerful. Okay, these are the $2 million ideas from, from today.